questions in the chat box. And at the end, we will get to those. So please do ask questions. We're gonna have a lot of interesting conversation here over the next hour. To tell us more, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bernie Pucker from the Pucker Gallery. Bernie, welcome. Delighted to be here. Good evening and welcome to our celebration of the Tales of Thomas, an atypical <laughs> biography about the life of Brother Thomas Bazanson. Brother Thomas wrote, memory is more permanent than matter. Nearly 13 years ago, our dear friend and colleague and teacher and remarkable artist, Brother Thomas died on the 16th of August, 2007. We had worked side by each for some 23 years, and he and I had exchanged faxes daily for all of those years. It was a unique conversation and a resource of personal, certainly in spiritual nourishment. We published four day books with his works of words of wisdom, one quote for each week. And these I will be including, a number of those quotes I'll be including during my remarks. We wanna honor the publication of this small tribute this evening, hosted with great thanks to the Boston Public Library's Never Too Late series. Gene Coles, who carefully gathered the tales of Thomas and then edited and designed this book, will share some of Thomas's words and works. We also want to share with you the powerful legacy that Brother Thomas created via the Brother Thomas Fellowships for Boston Artists. Umpa, one of the new fellows, will be part of our time together. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Let me begin by thanking Edith and Fred Bloom, who are now gone, and who introduced us to the work of a monk who made pots. They had come across him at the Western Priory in Vermont and had become loving friends with Brother Thomas. Thomas wrote, risking and dreaming are primary acts of creativity. In the early 80s, art galleries rarely showed pottery. It was relegated to the lower class of craft. However, I had loved clay and had purchased clay pots for our home and our own use for many years. We looked at a few of his works that the Bloom shared with us and decided to buy three small vases, which we still own. Soon thereafter, we had a chance to visit Brother Thomas at the Priory when the other brothers were away. It was somehow clear that he had made up his Nova Scotian mind to leave this idyllic setting. Once I understood this, I offered to help get him reestablished. Neither one of us knew what that meant. He left the Priory and after many twists and turns, ended up at Mount St. Benedict in Erie, Pennsylvania, at the amazing invitation of Sister Joan Chichester, and gradually magnificent pots began to emerge. They led to our first exhibition of his work in 1985, and we have done exhibitions of his work every two years thereafter. He wrote, first you do what is necessary, then you do what is possible, and before you know it, you are doing the impossible. Along the way, and with Thomas's full support, we were able to place his works into more than 75 museums around the world. He often said, the art is not complete until it is shared with others share he and we did. Each two years, he created approximately 1,200 pieces, and then with his hammer, broke more than 90% of those works because they did not speak to him. So over the 23 years we worked together, we actually received from him some 2,400 pieces. Then in December of 2006, when I was in Jerusalem and knew that he had taken ill, I called and learned that he had been diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer, that it had metastasized to his liver, and he was told that he had only two weeks to live. We visited him in Erie soon thereafter to say goodbye and to ask what he wanted us to do with the remaining 800 pieces, as we had already sold more than 1,600. He said, I wanna help struggling artists. And he wrote, and Gene will read to you this wonderful 
statement because before we moved ahead with this, I wanted to make sure I understood what he wanted. Jean? Okay, it says Bernie comes back and forth every other week. We are working on establishing and securing the BT Foundation for the future. It has been very time consuming, involving lawyers, of course, banks, and accountants. One of the basics has been a statement of purpose from me. I am clear and always have been clear about where and how I want the funds to be directed. I was helped by others when I was mouthed down in the dust, and I want to do the same for other artists in similar situations. I want to help those in need and not reward the successful. I want it to be an outright gift with no applications. It will be up to the trustees to know and locate artists in need, any artist, not just potters, e.g. painters, musicians, actors, whatever. It puts a burden on the trustees to be able to recognize and distinguish authentic artists and not just technical skill. Thank you so much. So we had the document and then with his direction, we approached the Boston Foundation, which now houses the Brother Thomas Foundation and awards fellowships to Boston artists of $15,000. There are now 56 Brother Thomas Fellows in our community, which amounts to $840,000 that has been awarded to Boston artists during this time. His legacy of creativity and generosity lives. He wrote, good is what we do, holy is what we become. It has been and remains a privilege and a blessing to have known Brother Thomas, to have worked with him, and now to implement his vision of helping artists of our community. Now over to Jean, who's going to share her journey into what I call Thomas land, <laughs> the magic and the energy of his art and his life. Jean. All right, thank you, Bernie. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to be reading some passages from the book, but before I do, as Bernie said, I wanted to talk and give a brief introduction um, about my process in writing this book. Um, I should start by saying that I knew Thomas for about 10 years. I worked with him at the Pucker Gallery in the late 90s and early 2000s. So when Bernie asked me to participate in this project, it felt like a real gift to be able to go back in time and relive those days and to be able to learn more about the artist Thomas that I knew well and to kind of lose myself in these daily faxes that Bernie and Thomas wrote over all these years and to get to speak to his friends, his family, uh, his acquaintances, fellow artists, collectors, many of whose stories and memories uh, end up in the book. Um, the most instrumental part of the process for me was that I got the chance to go to Erie, Pennsylvania to visit Mount St. Benedict. And um, this was the convent where Brother Thomas was artist in residence for 25 years. And while I was there, I got to tour all the facilities. I got to spend the night. I got to meet many of the sisters who lived with Thomas and loved him very dearly. And I also got to meet uh, this very close knit group of friends that he had in Erie. And I think that this was the real instrumental part of the project that helped me to create a book, which I hope captures Thomas's spirit. Um, as Bernie said in the beginning, it's an atypical biography. It's uh, not written in classic chapter form. Rather, it's a series of passages. Uh, they contain biographical information, they contain anecdotes, um, and each passage is complemented by one of Thomas's quotes. Um, many of these are taken from or some are taken from his formal writings, but the majority of the quotes are taken from his co correspondences with Bernie. Um, I'm gonna read about a dozen or so, and I hope that uh, these help to tell the tale of Thomas. And should you wanna read the entirety of the book, of course, it's available at the gallery and it's also published by Syracuse University Press, so it can be available through them as well. Um, before I even crack the spine on our book, um, I'm going to read a quote that's on the back cover. Uh, it's one of my favorites, which is why it ended up in such a prominent position. I think it speaks very clearly to who Thomas was as um, a man and as an artist. It's also really beautifully written and I think indicates why uh, Thomas's voice was so important, such an important part of making this book, um, including his voice. So he says, in art, all that is present in the physical product, its shape, its feel, its color, its harmony, must somehow be a doorway beyond those sensory things themselves. For you see, it is the function of art to open the human heart to those experiences 
which have the deepest meaning to the human spirit. Truth, beauty, goodness, unity. So I'm going to start from the beginning with Brother Thomas. All right. Brother Thomas was born Charles Byzantin on August 5th, 1929 in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He took the name Thomas 30 years later when he entered a Benedictine monastery in Western Vermont. Originally a Swiss French name, Bezantin became Byzantin when ancestors on Thomas's paternal side arrived in Nova Scotia in 1792. But Thomas more resembled his mother, a woman of Scottish stock. She was frugal, hardy, forthright, and wry, all characteristics that guided her when she was widowed in her 30s with nine small children. Thomas, another son, and seven daughters, the youngest whom was his dear sister Jackie. Now here's my Thomas quote. Out of my early years, I have a memory of sitting on a beach where a mountain met the sea, the mountain so permanent, the sea so constantly churning, changing, coming and going with the tide. The experience, while I did not then know why, remained in me. It was the symbol of the central paradox of all life, permanence and change. Now I'm gonna fast forward a little bit to when Thomas is a young man and uh, it's in the late 70s and he is um, kind of at a crossroads in his life deciding if he wants to be an artist or if he wants to go into business. And he's traveling in Europe so that he can um, kind of study art and figure out what it is that he wants to do. One day, while wandering the avenues of Rome, he fell into a fountain. When he woke the next day feeling sick, he feared tuberculosis, flew to London for a doctor, and was diagnosed with bronchitis and a viral infection. Back in Rome, he had used up his funds and his courage. Sitting on a bench, feeling adrift as the crowd scurried by, he was joined by a quiet man. A conversation began about Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk, writer, theologian, and mystic then turned to a place called Weston Priory. The man on the bench, it turns out, was Abbot Leo Rudloff, a spiritual luminary who had founded the fledgling monastery in 1953. Returning from Europe, Thomas talked with his sister Jackie and her husband Don about going to the priory, telling them, I think I've finally found a vocation. They thought he was crazy, but after he left, they found a cross in his room and realized he'd long been praying for guidance. Early on, I asked Abbot Leo what the monastic expression conversatio morum meant. Well, you see, brother, he said, there are two types of persons who come to a monastery, those who come to change themselves and those who come to change everyone else. The first is conversatio morum. It is also Gabriel Marcel's La Liberté de Vancouver, to conquer one's small, capricious self and free one's big, spiritual self. While you're going to the next, yes. uh, what I thought might be nice is if we begin showing some of the slides and people can be wonderful to think back or remember this being Thomas with his father and his brother as well. His brother died yep. fairly young and Thomas always lived with the fear that he might die early. And so you've got this wonderful um, composition or trio of these three gentlemen. That's his brother, Reginald, is his name. Um, okay, the next passage is this. Three weeks after Thomas arrived at Weston, a small electric kiln appeared. The nuns who ran St. Joseph College near Albany, New York, were closing the school's ceramic studio and dispersing the supplies. With living space at a minimum, the kiln and Thomas shared a room. A small area was cleared in the classroom for Thomas to organize a pottery shop, which developed gradually with scant financial resources. Thomas preferred Nova Scotian red earthenware clay, clay he used to dig out of the Shaw brick plant and lamp. Getting the clay to Vermont required ingenuity. Thomas's sister smuggled it in garbage bags over the border. Nova Scotian friends such as Potters Ernst and Alma Larenzen brought it on visits, and the brothers borrowed pickup trucks and drove Thomas to Nova Scotia. He carried this clay with him for more than 35 years, using it here and there long after he had shifted to porcelain. Now his quote. In my early years as a painter, the smell of oil paint was not a pleasing odor in our household, but it was like catnip to me. Later, the feeling of clay in my hands was immediately seductive. It spoke to me. Artists, for the most part, are captured by one medium or another. There is some kind of current that runs between art, artist, and medium that is easier to acknowledge than explain. Now, 
In a common practice of self-edification and to contribute more fully to the monastic life, brothers often pursued studies outside the monastery. In 1968, Thomas graduated from University of Ottawa with a master's degree in philosophy and a university gold medal. These years gave structure to Thomas's innate understanding of the fundamental nature of existence. He remembers reading the great French philosopher, Gabriel Marcel's Thoughts on Freedom, on which he would later expand in his own writings. And he says, freedom coincides with love, which no longer seeks itself, but the other. And now also as part of his time at the monastery in the late 1970s, he organized a research trip to Japan and Taiwan along with some of the brothers. And this was, um, so I'm gonna, that's where we are in this passage, he's in Japan. At the Tokyo National Museum, brother Thomas and the brothers were greeted by the curator of the ceramics collection who presented them select examples of ancient Chinese ceramics. One of these was a large vase with a Honan Tenmoku glaze, approximately a thousand years old. The vase was put on a cloth covered table and Thomas was invited to examine it as closely as he wanted, then handle it if he wished. After looking at it for a while, he picked it up and held it close to himself, seeking communion with the vase and the ancient potter who made it. He would later recount that just those few minutes had made the whole trip worthwhile. In that moment, Thomas realized that his iron glaze, which he had spent many years researching and refining without knowledge of any antecedents, turned out to be the ancient Chinese Honan Tenmoku. And the slide and quoted, I'm sorry, yeah. the slide that's on no, no. right now is a perfect example of Thomas making that glaze and then extending it. Because at the top of the slide, you'll see this rich accumulation of iron. And he just ran with it and grew with it in a way that no one else literally has ever done. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so the quote on that page is, amazing how people of the same spirit seem to flow on some kind of river of intuition. Okay. Thomas returned from Japan inspired to work, but also with a burgeoning longing to devote himself to his art in a way that fit less comfortably with the monastic schedule and philosophy. Brothers at Weston met three times a day to make communal decisions on every aspect of life, a routine often at odds with the rigors of making ceramics and the doctrine increasingly incompatible with Thomas's creative spirit. As Thomas's sense of his place in the Priory shifted, his dear friend Fred Bloom was in Boston, speaking about him and his ceramic art to gallerist Bernie Pucker. Bernie Pucker and his wife Sue loved pottery, but their gallery did not deal in ceramics. Brother Thomas would eventually change that, ushering in a tradition of ceramics at Pucker Gallery and establishing a profound friendship. He says, it isn't until you realize that you aren't in control of change that you can be a part of it. So this particular plate is one of about 30 that he did over the entire time we worked together. And he did one or two, they're all hand thrown and they were for him a very important statement. So eventually we did a, book of just the plates called Offerings of the Spirit. Before you go on, Jean, this is Sister Joan with Tom. And it's such an important <laughs> moment, which endured for 23 years because Joan took it upon herself to invite Thomas to be an artist in residence along with 140 nuns. And he was the only one living <laughs> there with them. And they ended up adoring him. And I think Joan was the leader of the band. That's a perfect segue because that's my next passage. So, mm -hmm. while still at Weston, Thomas befriended two sisters from Erie, Pennsylvania, who frequented Weston Priory. For several years, the sisters conferred with their prioress, Sister Joan Chittister, who was acquainted with Thomas, about the plight of the monk, in the hopes that the sisters might offer him a refuge. Sister Joan believed that a monastery is not a monastery without an artist. Possible arrangements were considered, such as offering the chaplain's quarters or finishing off a corrugated shed at Camp Lenodo, the mountain nearby camp. Obstacles abounded. Sister Joan would say, we cannot do this for a million reasons, but it is right, it is right, it is right. In 1985, Thomas found a home with the Benedictine Sisters of Erie, Pennsylvania. Then, Thomas said, magical things began to happen. And uh, this is his quote on this page. To find oneself truly free for the other and not from the other is surely what it means to be fully human. For we have not awakened to the spirit of humanity if our only sense of freedom is our own. 
there's a wonderful side note that when Thomas showed up with 20,000 pounds of equipment, Sister Joan <laughs> got a call from the nuns at Pax Christi where they were intending to put his studio. And they said, Joan, the kiln will not fit through the door. And so Joan said, take it down. And they brought the kiln in and they installed it. And she got a second call. Joan, this is a gas fired kiln in the middle of the inner city. This is totally illegal. And Joan responded by saying, you know, we're very good at asking for forgiveness, not for permission. And as a result, Thomas fired there for 23 years in the middle of the inner city. <laughs> and I got a perfect segue to my next reading. So here it is. Thomas lived for about 10 years at Camp Bonotto, tried sleeping two nights at the mount where the pipes were too loud, and then eventually settled in one of the sister's small group living houses in Erie called Pax Priory. His studio was only a few short steps away in a former office supply company mailroom that Sister Joan had procured for $1. The woes of settling Thomas were numerous. A flatbed semi-truck had to be rented to transport his semi-ton kiln. The narrow entrance to the mailroom had to be replaced with double doors. A hole needed to be cut in the ceiling for ventilation, and a 500-gallon propane tank had to be surreptitiously sighted in an alleyway in the middle of a congested residential area. The studio, which he thought of as his inner mountain, was perpetually messy. Once, Sister Joan and Sister Maureen wanted to bring Eunice Kennedy Shriver on a visit to Thomas's studio. He responded that the studio is one of its rat's nest modes, work and process all over the tables and even on the floor, papers everywhere, and God only knows what it smells like to the uninitiated. And it's, his quote here is, keeping the balance is everything for an artist. So many things can tip this fragile process. So this is another- Being free to- oh, sure. This is another of the pieces, again, that Thomas developed this form and then allowed the glaze to be poured on it and then recognized in it something very, very special, which was this, I, the wonderful facts is from him right before we would pick up the hundred pieces or so every couple of years. And he would say, I opened it and there was a miracle in front of me. And then he would put a star by three of the hundred pieces. Those were the miracle pieces. This was one of them. <laughs> Being free to work in Erie fed Thomas's soul, but the urban environment, difficult winters, and daily burdens of life brought stresses that often pulled this self-proclaimed charismatic warrior from his work. Just six months after moving to Erie, he declared to Sister Joan that everything was wrong. The food, the kiln, the noise, the drivers. Sister Joan countered with a sharp, so are you saying you're done? In this challenge to his identity, he found the will to make it work and he went back to work. Months turned to years following an emotional and creative ebb and flow with doubts and issues with firing punctuated by the wonderment of beautiful creation. Great beauty sprung from the inner city. As Sister Joan said, the art lived in him and he lived for the art. And then he says about Erie, somehow things have their own way of working out what is best for you, even when you don't know what is best for you. An example, Erie the last place in the world I would choose to be for me, but it works for my work and that is what I'm about. There's a wonderful experience that I had with Brother Thomas when we were doing a documentary in 1991 and we were in Japan at Riowanji, which is this beautiful rock garden. And I said to Thomas, we were there at 6.30 in the morning. I said, Thomas, what were you thinking sitting on the bench next to the garden? And he said, I was dreaming that I was on a mountaintop in Vermont. Mm. The people in Vermont were difficult. The people in Erie were beautiful. And that's where the art and the beauty emerged. Another wonderful segue to the next reading. Um, in some ways, the world orbited around Thomas. The sisters cared for him and he derived great nourishment from their life of prayer and their friendship. Lured away from his own canned soup dinners by the aroma of the sisters cooking, Thomas often took his meals in the community room at PAC, watching baseball, tennis, or Jeopardy in what the sisters dubbed Thomas's chair. He would clip recipes out of the local paper, even though he didn't cook, in the hopes the sisters would make the dishes for him. As he did not drive, he would often rely on the sisters for transportation. Sister Marlene Berkey would drive him every Sunday to the same vendor to purchase the New York Times. At his funeral, Sister Maureen quipped that she should have been driving his hearse. 
she had spent so many years chauffeuring him around. He says, I am one with the community in spirit and in heart. So the piece that's on the screen now is Thomas's invention. It's also an iron based glaze that never had been created before in the history of ceramics. Basically, the iron somehow is transformed into an iron yellow. So he took the Honen Tamoku formula and adjusted it and then created these again wonderful pieces of magic and landscapes wherever your imagination wants to go, you can go with him. <laughs> Perfect that this photo just came up for this passage. An intimate circle of friends developed around Thomas and Erie, including Sister Joan, Sister Maureen, Sandy Bach, who's pictured here, Christine McClure and Perry Baker, Bob and Maureen Dwyer, and Jeff Dunn. Dr. Dunn, sitting quietly in the Mount's library while his young son took music lessons there, gradually got to know the equally reserved brother Thomas, a frequent fixture among the stack. A conversation sparked, out of which grew a profound fraternal relationship. The friendship included action movies and sports, as well as hours of philosophical, historical, artistic, and spiritual discourse. Dunn, who was a painter as well as a physician, recalled a gifted man whose spiritual force brought out heightened spiritual awareness in everyone he touched, who identified with Mozart, but who also enjoyed bonbons and champagne as a respite from the frequent agony and fleeting ecstasy of his work. And here I have a quote by another quote by Dr. Dunn instead of one by Thomas on this page, which says, Oh, look, there they are. That's Dr. Dunn in the back. Some would call him a mystic, but that would have made him put his hands on his chest and laugh with some embarrassment. However, he would have said that love is the means and the purpose of the creative act that directs us within and beyond. It's a perfect photograph. And you should know that during the time after Thomas was diagnosed, theoretically having only two weeks to live, that within four weeks, they took out the feeding tube and Sue and I and friends made 16 trips to Erie over the next eight months. And what ensued was a development of what we called the Thomas Gang. And we would mm -hmm. arrive, have lunch together with Thomas. Mind you, he had stomach cancer. And then he would rest, we would spend time in the studio and then the Erie Gang would meet at the Erie Club. Oh, this is so wonderful. <laughs> to see his handwriting. And even to the very end, during those eight months, the faxes kept coming in this clear, beautiful handwriting. Okay. In 1994, Brother Thomas celebrated his 65th birthday and his kiln was aging as well. He wondered if he should junk this kiln with whom he had produced so many beautiful children for 40 plus years and over which hung his handwritten sign that read, the womb of God. Then he answered, no, I will not get a new wife. We will go on and change together. We have wrestled with God for some new faith of the beautiful. We will continue. He analogized his own age to a plateau from which he needed to look at future things, a plateau for gathering in and reflecting on what he needed to look after for the years ahead. And the quote here is, one has to journey within for a plateau of peace. When Brother Thomas was diagnosed with cancer in December 2006 and given weeks to live, he comforted those who loved him by saying, don't worry, I'm not dying in three weeks, too much to do. The cancer began in his stomach, then metastasized in his liver. Thomas declined operative therapy for palliation of his symptoms, a choice made seemingly easier by his spiritual preparedness. As he faced his terminal illness, he taught those around him as much about how to live as how to die. Throughout his final months, Thomas continued the discipline of his work, a confirmation that his art and his life were one. He lived in the moment, approaching each day as an opportunity to create, to share in his friendship, to meditate, to loosen his hold on the material, and to deepen his inner wisdom. And his quote here is, will I be able to live as I should like to die, freely, courageously, fully, gracefully, and mm -hmm. close the door with neither a whimper nor a bang, but quietly, thankfully, and beautifully. Now I have uh, one more passage to read, which is going to circle us back to the Brother Thomas Fund and the Fellows. And um, and then I'm going to give back to Bernie to introduce Umpa. Jean, just one for many, yeah. Yeah. Let me just interrupt you for one second. Because sure. what you just read about Thomas during those eight months was so true. The only time he mentioned a moment of regret was when he first told me of the diagnosis. 
and he said, someone has stopped my merry-go-round and they didn't ask. <laughs> For the next eight months, he only invested in living and he followed, he managed to do two more firings. Those pieces we have in the gallery at this point are some of them, but it was an amazing experience of how to live with the full understanding that life and death are part of the same circle. Thomas is a magnificent teacher. Definitely. All right, so this is my last passage, just bringing us full circle back to the Brother Thomas Fund. For many years, Brother Thomas pondered how he could support what is good, true, and beautiful, those things that unite and do not divide. He wondered how to turn what little he possessed into a legacy well beyond his material means, and how to give a helping hand to artists as so many had done for him. The Brother Thomas Fund was established at the Boston Foundation in 2007 with the mission to support and celebrate artists working at a high level of excellence in a range of disciplines and to enhance their ability to thrive and create work. All fellows received no strings attached awards of $15,000 and are selected biannually through a rigorous multidisciplinary process of nomination and review by a panel of nonprofits, arts leaders, and practitioners. And I love this quote, the final one. I do not know how the alchemy of changing a spirit works, but I do observe it happening, and I do experience that it does not happen in isolation. No one does anything alone. Perfect way, Jean. Thank you so much. And You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your journey into Thomas Land, because what you did was enable us who had lived alongside Thomas for 23 years to actually then highlight these moments and remember yeah. them with great gratitude. So thank you very, very much. Yeah. It's been beautiful. You're Just welcome. Hear you read Thomas again along the way. I'm also delighted to say to you that the criteria for Thomas's fellows has enlarged itself beyond their artistic uniqueness into their role in making this a better world. So their social engagement has become a great part of the selection of the individual artists who have been chosen. So it's very exciting tonight to have Umpa with us was both a poet, a rapper, and an educator. And Thomas would have greatly, greatly enjoyed knowing each of the 56, but especially Umpa. Take it over, please. Hello, friends. How's everyone doing out there? I hope well. Thank you for having me. And wow, thank you so much, Bernie, for saying that. Um, the more and more I learn about who uh, Brother Thomas was, the more and more I felt like we would just been very, very good friends. Um, <laughs> one thing that stuck out in particular, well, there are two things, is, is how messy he was and how messy his space was. <laughs> and I don't know why that stuck with me, but I'm always defending um, kind of like how my, my space in front of me always looks like my brain space. And often in order to make sense of something, you got to make mess of it first. So I really appreciated that. Um, also, uh, one of the other quotes that you mentioned um, was that uh, artists are great riskers and great dreamers. Um, and so often I, I feel uh, great, sh not shame, but I think that the world doesn't always know how to uplift um, those two things. Like I, and I feel like I'm a professional risk taker and dreamer. And so to be a Brother Thomas Fellow is a great honor for many reasons, including the fact that, again, the more and more I learn about Brother Thomas, the more and more I think he just understood something about life and artistry um, as a mechanism to communicate with and from God. And uh, I, I'm really honored uh, to be a part of that legacy. Um, so often, too, I think that like one of my mentors said when uh, when money walks in the room, God walks out. And so I think oftentimes <laughs> as artists, we're spending so much time just trying to uh, figure out how to live and how to eat and how to sustain ourselves that we continue to uh, commodify this, this process um, or have to like always know what to negotiate and what not to. And so um, I'm super humbled to be a Brother Thomas Fellow also because um, it has afforded me the opportunity to, to create without having to compromise quality or to compromise myself and my process. I was able to take um, my latest project, Clio, on the, on the road. Um, so we went to about 10 different states, um, out to the Midwest, a little bit to the South, and came back up. 
Um, and I was also able to, to do some musing on my next project. So just want to thank the people at the Boston Foundation, the Brother Thomas Fellowship, and all of you um, here uh, for, for supporting artists and supporting me in particular. Uh, I'm done talking now. I'm ready to talk in a new way. So I'm going to do two songs that I think are my favorite to perform, um, in part because both of these songs, I think, get to my most my favorite fundamental truths, which are that gratitude goes a long way and that we all want to be loved. So um, this first song is called By You, uh, and it's the one about wanting to be loved and about going to therapy because we need that, right? Because it's complicated here. Okay. Can you hear me just fine? Yeah. All right, we're good. Check. Yo. My therapist asked me why I care so much or why I wear so much of other people's problems who just stare, don't touch. And when I'm looking around and I need care, no luck. They ask me if I pay my bills, damn, hold up, Julianne. I'm just in your chair because my girl said that I can't blow up. Therapy's how I tell her that I am grown up, but that don't mean you can read me like a tarot, bruh. I think you got a point. Think I'm kind of annoyed. Now I got to pride about the wise and high drowning devices in my life. And I never ever seem to really ever find a boy like cookie, liquor, homies, cigarettes, weed. Spending all my little checks on frivolous deeds. Like, do I need that? Can I use that? I'ma keep that. I know it will eventually. Y'all, I be addicted to love too, huh? I find another one one through y'all and i can't stop saying yes to anything attention twitter beefs nephews anything to hear i love you i think that's it i watch her watch me as she sits like what you think i've been trying to tell you for this last whole hour you little <laughs> i want to be loved i want to be loved like you like you like you i want to be loved i want to be loved like you like you like you i want to be loved I want to be loved like you, like you, like you. I want to be loved, I want to be loved like you, like you. I said, Lord, forgive me for this bottle. I know I told you I would quit. I know I told you I would quit like too, but this poison make me forget all those promises that was bottomless. If I swim a little bit farther, it's probably all the kids without fathers here. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be taking that dip, uh-huh. We was all moving them zips, uh-huh. Little jits running around hitting licks. I still couldn't make it, I bought them up barrels on my now, it's making me sick, y'all. I don't really mess with college or principal profits for all intents and purposes, but what a J without them sticks? What if I checked up on camp? If there is a wrong place and wrong time for brothers, then where is the right one to go to repent? To go figure out what your heaven has sent us to do and not get us stuck, heaven sent. Before the caskets, before the voices, before the gavels, before the horses. White nights and white flight, black of corpses, drunk nights and night fights, crashing courses, y'all. I know my anxiety's peaking, inspired by sobriety leaving. Just don't make me out to be one of your drunken mistakes. Mistakes, man, I know what I'm thinking, huh? You turned that water to wine. You took the edge off of being a chosen one. Fine, me and Tequila just trying to be your image is how you made mine. So I wanna be loved. I wanna be loved like you, like you, like you. I wanna be loved. I wanna be loved like you, like you, like you. I wanna be loved. I wanna be loved. Like you, like you, like you. I wanna be loved, I wanna be loved. Like you. I wanna be someone you lean on. I don't pick up the phone and let it ring on. I wanna be someone you trust in. Can I get a minute? No more fighting, no more fussing. I wanna be. More stable, I fall into my knees. I am not willing, I'm not able. I wanna be divine. I can't become a soul or my body or my mind. Yeah. I wanna be loved. Yeah. I wanna be loved. Yeah. I wanna be loved. I just wanna be loved. Yeah. I wanna be loved. One more, we're gonna take it out after that. I wanna be loved, I wanna be loved like you, like you, like you. I wanna be loved, I wanna be loved like you, like you, like you. I wanna be loved, I wanna be loved by you. Hey, I wanna be loved, I wanna be loved by you.
<laughs> Word. So that song's called Bayou. It typically features in Jimmy and uh, my vocal family. <laughs> but today it is just me because quarantine is quite a thing, ain't it? Um, so this next song and my last song is called Thank You. And I love to end all my sets right now, right now, with thank you um, as both a way to uh, kind of put me in the context so that folks understand. Um, I, I, talk, I do a lot of narrative uh, and like autobiographical stuff and that is both beautiful and sometimes not the easiest to consume. And so I like to end it with thank you as a way for people to know that I'm always in gratitude for being alive and in this body and protesting as, as, as being an alive black person. Um, and, and also as a way to say thank you for folks to folks who are listening. And so thank you for those of you at home, out in the park, walking your dogs, whatever you're doing. Thank you. It also requires participation. I grew up in a black church. And so, you ready? Tell me you're ready. All right, ready. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see you, family. Yeah, I'm this, my mama be there, I ain't going back to school, sad. You been gone now, years, no 40 acres on the mule, sad. I be high ham if the homie ain't free. Still in word in America, that news be chasing me, but I be flexing like I ain't stressed. Like, 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 ain't no depression, the black jets and boy, it's hell yeah, ain't no yes, sons. Ain't no time card, ain't no wage gap. I'm behind that wheel of fortune, no van and no sage, like my sisters. I see you, folk, that day I pay you for the vision. You leave them no and put a few fries in the bucket when it ain't your stove. But when it comes to your business, you take no shorts. Hey, that's some real for you. I feel for you, but they always want me to dance. I tell them if the check ain't thick as me, I really can. But if it is, then you know I'm hitting that milli rock. I hit the bank, the 401k, then I left my block. Really, what did you ask? And culture vultures get taxed. Black as the Uncle Sam, man. I'm black as the back of hands. Black as the magic sand coming back from my pie and laughing. No borders and pies, man. Back up, we bought the blam like I can't believe I came this far. And I can't believe I lost it all. And when I think about all I want, I got I gotta thank you, thank you, hey. I can't believe I came this far. I can't believe I lost it all. When I think about all I won, I gotta thank you, y'all. On that black chubby hood, ride big dog with the good, yeah. Smoking, mm -hmm, trying to buy the hood back. I know that they mad at me, but I escaped that felony. And if you want me behind bars, you gotta pay my salary. Turn the pain to melody, they trying to pick my brain. Uber, you do your thing, trying to do that the same. I be like, you ain't got it, can't make a dollar from change. That we cut from a different cloth and your fabric, that's out my brain. I don't know how to wear it, I don't know how to panic. I just go like I, man, there she go. Hold that nabbit, she gon' blow in the name, man, cause when she go, then she gon' grab it, hit the stove, she won't, she have, don't know. I'm full of magic, y'all. I can't believe I came this far. I can't believe I lost it all. When I think about all I've won, I gotta thank you. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe I came this far. I can't believe I lost it all. When I think about all I've won, I got it's your turn. Ready? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 and in doing what you do, which is to share for all of us, the basic underlying commitments, I think that Thomas held, mm. which is the joy of life and basically talking truth. He talked about it consistently, but he wanted the truth that he obviously said should unite and not divide. Mm. And that was so critical to his entire approach to his work. Mm. And he felt that work needed to express the best in all of humankind mm. and therefore, and in a way act, even though it was an inanimate object, to energize us to be better people, wow. to live more kindly, more generously. And so that privilege alone has now been multiplied by 56 <laughs> of the artists in Boston, all of whom have received these fellowships. Absolutely. And if I think back to the year when I visited him at the Western Priory, before he left the Priory, and to think that here this monk was making pots that they were selling in the gift shop. They were actually sort of mugs 
um, in a very humble way, but feeling that there was something else that he was put on earth to do. Mm. And once he got the eerie, that was somehow unleashed. And what we mm. have been able to show in the gallery is the result of those 23 years of his own journey, which then inspires, I think, the artists like Ompa and the other fellows to realize that what is most important in them is their own spirit that enables them to enrich the spirit of everyone else around them. So it's an enormous privilege to have dealt with somebody like Thomas um, over all these years. The faxes came every day. I don't know if any of you can ever have a relationship, a brother, a sister, a wife, a partner, where every day you had a correspondence of thoughtful, wise information coming to you. And that's what Thomas provided. So at the end of the day in the gallery, I would send him a fax. And next morning after he had done his prayers, he sent me a fax. So it was an ongoing dialogue for 23 years of how one lives their life with Thomas as a teacher and guide. So it was an enormous, enormous privilege for sure. I don't know if there are questions, which we can certainly mm -hmm. entertain, but we're certainly happy to do that um, about mm -hmm. Thomas, about his work uh, that people would like to submit. If so, we're more than happy to entertain them. And if not, then I'm more than happy to go back to look at one or two of the slides and share the tales of Thomas. Kristen, what's your pleasure? Hi, uh, that, was, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I think um, what we can do is if you want to go back and talk about a couple of the pieces, maybe we could do that right now, if that makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. Maybe we could put up the eggs, Bernie. You could talk about them. Any one of them is fine. Um, there's a photograph. We can look at the, the millennial eggs for sure. But if you look at the range of the glazes, what you're dealing with are two fundamental uh, chemicals, copper and iron. And particularly the red piece brings to mind a wonderful story of a man who visited the gallery, um, all dressed up in a three-piece suit, very, very handsome well coughed and so forth. And Thomas and I were standing at the back of the gallery. And Thomas said, hello, Tom, across about 50 feet. And Tom was stunned. And I said, Thomas, why, he was, why was he so surprised? He said, because the last time I saw him, he had a beard and a ponytail. And what Thomas saw was not the physical manifestation of the individual, but the spirit of the person who had come into his world. Many years later, Tom visited, and he mentioned to me that when he was 15, he visited the Priory, and Brother Thomas called him aside and said, now, Tom, I want you to stand outside the kitchen. And Thomas, as a guard, and just alert me if anyone else is coming. Thomas went into the kitchen, and he then took the chore boy pads, which were pure copper, which he could grind down, and then out of the pure copper, copper came that red glaze that you saw in that piece. So that's how he discovered copper reds. The Chinese <laughs> centuries trying to do copper reds, but Thomas used what was available to him in the monastery in order to develop many, many of the glazes. And in this slide, if you look at the right-hand shelf as you're seeing it, the little tubes, those are test tiles, which he worked on year after year after year, ended up making approximately 20,000 test tiles taking notes because he knew what the glaze was, where it was in the kiln, so that he could then begin to work on developing that glaze on pieces that would be fired exactly in that same place. So essentially what Thomas was doing was combining both spirit and belief and science. And therefore he was constantly learning and growing. One of the miracles of ceramics for me is that it's not only an artistic expression, but it's also a very unforgiving expression. And so if you, your piece breaks, you have to figure out why it broke. 
if it cracks, if the glaze doesn't come out as you expected, you need to go back to the drawing board and reconfigure it. So the science part of it was unforgiving. And Thomas enjoyed that and really trusted that and then used that as a basis to continue to what Umpa rem remarked about risking and dreaming are primary acts of creativity. So it was consistently risking and dreaming to create all the pieces that we have been able to show over these years. And so many people around the country and around the world actually live with them and enjoy them. So it's been an enormous journey <clears throat> in being human and being wise about being human. <clears throat> This piece I mentioned before, but just a, a miracle of a piece. And there may be three other pieces where so much iron accumulates at the very top of it. I love this picture. <laughs> of so look at the red pieces, the reds, the purples, the greens, all yeah. on the copper glaze. And Tom is so serious. Yeah, <laughs> that's his kiln in the background that produced all of those pieces over all of those years. We consistently said to him, Thomas, you need to have better ventilation. You need to ne use masks and so forth to better protect yourself. This is long before COVID. And he would say, oh, I've got a mask. And we'd go to the hardware store and spend 10 cents on a mask. There was no way. Most of the ceramic artists that we deal with put themselves at risk because of the clay dust and then the fumes from the glazes that they use. Here again, this beautiful copper underneath it. But look at the edge of the piece the glaze itself vaporizes at the edge if it's done correctly. So you get a white outline of this piece and then the dancing color across it. And then there was nobody like Joan in the world, um, even to this day, who stands up and speaks out so fervently and with such, such passion about mm -hmm. the importance of human dignity in this world. And she saved Thomas. All the works that we have, all the works that he made in those 23 years, would not have been born without Sister Joan's faith in him and fundamental belief that there needed to be a, an artist in the community because part of the Benedictine way of life is to also celebrate life and God through art. And I think very much so that Thomas was such an important part of this entire experience, um, both for the community and for all of us now who have been able to share in that legacy. I think Tales of Thomas was our attempt to somehow honor him and honor what he had created. This is so lovely. When we flew to Erie, we would go to Buffalo and then drive to Erie. We called him from the airport and he knew exactly when we were going to arrive. And there he was peeking out from the door of his studio, waiting to greet <laughs> us with that generous smile and little twinkle in his eye. An extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity to be part of a world that was defined by a really humble monk named Brother Thomas Bizanson. We do have a question, Bernie, if I may just jump in here. Please. Remy is asking, what are Brother Thomas's tools and glazes now? What what or rather what did he, what did he work with sort of toward the end of his life? He, so one of the tools was a cut up credit card. Thomas was nothing else parsimonious um, in, in spending money. So <laughs> were very simple ones. And at the end, he made absolutely certain through his executor, a man named Bob McTaggart, who just died. Bob was an extraordinary friend of Thomas. And Thomas made quite clear beyond the foundation, beyond all the things that we did with the art, that everything that Thomas had created, his notes, his glaze formulas, his glazes, all those things were totally destroyed. Thomas didn't do it because he was trying to begrudge other people the information he had learned. Thomas did it because he believed that each individual artist is on their own journey and that the works that they accumulate have to come out of their own spirit. And those are not recipes. Those are not cone 10 firing numbers. Those are what the individual does. And they were for him like his private notes. And he felt that those should never be public. Mm -hmm. This kiln actually was then given to a university nearby so they could continue with the ceramics program there. Virtually everything, including the mess in the studio was 
essentially assigned. The artwork <laughs> that he rarely purchased but traded for was each designated to someone in whose life that artwork would be meaningful. He used every day of those eight months to make sure that everyone in his life that he cared for was attended to in a very beautiful, very meaningful, and in many ways, a very supportive way. Thank you very much. We don't have any other questions right now, but I think Umpa might be joining us again in just a moment if we can all just hang on. And maybe what I'll do is, is um, just since we are close to the end of our time together before Umpa joins us and takes us out, I'd just like to maybe thank everyone for this powerful, powerful hour. Um, thank you, Umpa. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Jean. Thank you You're all welcome. for coming. Thank, thank you to Jane Amanda for the technology today. And on behalf of the Boston Public Library, this was a fascinating and powerful program. And um, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Real pleasure. Thomas has one quote that may be relevant as I wrote down at the end of my notes. In the midst of this chaotic world, Thomas's wisdom should inspire us. And he wrote, consciousness of the beautiful will save the world. Up to you, Umpa, to say good night. <laughs>
days I sit and wish I was a kid again Back in the days when I was young I'm not a kid anymore Some days I sit and wish I was a kid again Back in the days when I was young I'm not a kid anymore Some days I sit and wish I was a kid again Back in the days when I was young I'm not a kid anymore I'm not a kid anymore Hey good luck, now let's dance Woo. Woo. You could take me back Hey, hey Take me back, uh huh. Ooh, 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 ooh. You can take me back. Hey, take me back, y'all. You can take me back. Word. Thank you, friends. <laughs> Hope you all have a great night. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, well, for Thank letting me you. join in on on the celebration tonight. I'm truly, truly honored to be a brother Thomas fellow. So, thank you. We're honored to have you. Thank you, Kristen, for everything. Thank, Thank you. you.